Great. Thanks everyone for joining another protocol symposium. Uh, today we have Henry. Henry is the founder of Penumbra, a fully private uh, Cosmos chain uh, with built-in DEX. I've, I've been uh, hearing about this for a very long time. And each time I start to think about this, uh, I get really confused. How is this thing is even possible? So I was <laughs> trying to learn about it for a very long time, but I didn't have time. I'm very happy that today we can learn from Henry. Uh, thanks for accepting the invitation and take it away. Yeah, I'm super excited to be here and, and share stuff that, that we've been working on. Um, so the title of the talk is end-to-end -end protocol design for Penumbra. I'll do like a little bit of a kind of motivational intro and then get right into the sort of protocol stuff. Um, so part of the motivation is, is the sense of like, okay, what are we all building? Um, we are building coordination technology. Um, if, if not for that, what would be the point? But the problem uh, as I see it is that doing real world coordination requires control over information right? Um, you need to, if you're only playing perfect information games where everybody can see everything at all times, you're limiting yourself to a very small subset of the types of coordination that are possible or useful. And so we need to have systems for doing private coordination. But here we are, um, you know, 10, 10 years into programmable blockchains, and we haven't really seen that happen yet. So for Penumbra, the strategy is instead of trying to do uh, everything, let's start by trying to build one useful application first, and then use the oh sorry uh, use the lessons that we learn from having one useful application to try to uh, explore um the the design space at large so what we decided to build is uh first of all it's a private proof of stake l1 um making it its own l1 allows us to have complete flexibility about the um state and data model to kind of uh, build a blockchain unburdened by what has been um and what that chain provides is an interchain shielded pool. So you can take any asset from any chain, transfer it over IBC into Penumbra, and the IBC handler is integrated with the shielded pool so that when funds land inside of Penumbra, they're automatically deposited into the shielded pool. So the privacy boundary of the chain is the IBC boundary, and you don't have a situation like you know, uh, with, with Zcash where people have to manage conceptually, like, am I in a transparent pool or a shielded pool? Um, the entire rest of the cross-chain ecosystem is our transparent pool. And so why would you bring your funds in uh, there at all? Uh, Penumbra is the only place that you can do on-chain trading with private strategies. So otherwise you have to choose between either I'm gonna go on a centralized exchange and then my counterparties can't see my trade history, but I do have to give up custody of my funds. Uh, or I could do trading on chain, in which case we can use all of this cool programmable custody stuff that, that we've all been building. But in that case, everybody can see all of my activity. And our goal for Penumbra is we could uh, break that trade-off and, and do both. Um, so in thinking about this problem, right, uh, before working on Penumbra, I worked uh, on Zcash and before that on, on doing other um, crypto uh, cri cryptography uh, infrastructure. Um, there's this question of like, okay, we're going to build one at private application. I've just told you what that application is, but What's the theory of why building a DEX is, is an interesting thing to do as a, as a product? 
And the thought there is that uh, every market is also a market in information, right? The idea of price discovery is that the market is going to uh, provide an aggregated view of, of all of the information that's available. And what that means is that information leaks are value leaks. And so this is potentially uh, a, an opportunity for a private system to outcompete transparent alternatives. So the, the theory is that this is a case where privacy isn't just a kind of an abstract uh, concept, but where it could potentially deliver real product value if the execution is good enough. Um, and as someone who's interested in privacy, right? Like it's clear that just saying like, oh, this is a, a point of principle, like that's not a compelling product. It actually has to be better. So now we get to the section that is, you know, the real like protocol part. Uh, what is all the protocol design that tries to make this uh, possible? And what are some of the challenges that we have to overcome? So the first piece of context that I wanna talk about is the distinction between the uh, state model on a transparent chain and the state model on a shielded chain. So the insight here is that privacy is enabling edge compute for blockchains. And that is probably not, you know, too unfamiliar. Like that's in some way kind of the whole like roll up centric architecture, et cetera. But for a, a privacy chain, you kind of push that all the way to the limit, right? We want to have uh, the data be only on the end user devices. And the key difference there is that rather than using this uh, kind of EVM-like paradigm of having mutable state where each transaction does stuff to that state, and then changes it, and then you have the next transaction and it has access to the whole world, and then you do the next thing in sequence. We need to have a chain where we have composable state. So, you know, the word UTXO has a lot of baggage that's associated to Bitcoin, but you can think of this as in some way being a kind of return to a UTXO model where we're gonna take this big uh, global state and then we're going to fragment it into a, a bunch of little tiny pieces. And then each transaction, rather than having free access to the entire world and change anything, is going to declare, like, these are the state fragments that I'm consuming as part of this transaction. And these are the new state fragments that I'm producing. And then those new fragments can be added into some set of states. And the reason that you want to do this model uh, conceptually is that this is what's going to allow you to make your state transitions private. So the, the next move to build a, 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 along the way to a shielded chain is you take this um, set of state fragments and you replace it with a tree of opaque commitments. And then instead of having the transaction actually do all of the execution, you're going to have the, the transaction say, okay, here are the commitments that I'm consuming. Here are some new commitments that I'm producing. And even though I'm not gonna give the, right? So I'm, I'm in this chart sort of, there's the hollow boxes, which are the opaque commitments and the solid ones, which have the full data. I'm not gonna give you the full um, state but I'm gonna give this ZK proof that I did that state transition correctly. And now I can have a, a state transition that's private, but all the other users of the chain can verify that that was done correctly. And that's great. But what I kind of alighted in that, you know, nice explanation with this nice diagram or whatever is that there's actually been a pretty big change in that now this, the client has to maintain all of the state to do proving. And we could draw this a little bit more accurately uh, by drawing a distinction between what's on-chain and what's off-chain. And what we've actually done to keep the user data private and keep it off the chain 
is, well, we moved it off the chain. So the execution has moved off chain. And now every user effectively has their own little personal micro rollup. And all of the problems that appear with, you know, rollup composability are also going to appear with uh, shielded chains. And I think that this is in, you know, it wasn't, it would never have been described this way, say, five years ago. But I think this is actually one of the problems that caused a lot of problems for sort of first gen private chains like Zcash. So let's dig into that a little bit more. There's this perspective of a shielded transaction as being um, like its own little micro rollup. And uh, I've drawn a kind of schematic view of like what the transaction data for a shielded transaction is. Um, the first key uh, block there is that there's a ZK proof, which is gonna provide trust to the rest of the system that everything else was, was done correctly. Uh, there's a set of commitments to new output states that are produced by the transaction. And there's a set of nullifiers that are used to consume input states. So a difference in this sort of picture versus a, a more traditional kind of uh, rollup is that normally when someone is updating a rollup on chain, they're, they're actually, you know, they say like, hey, I'm like whatever rollup and I'm going to update it. But when we do a shielded transaction, we want to somehow be able to say like, I'm advancing the state of something without disclosing exactly which states I'm consuming or updating, right? I'm going to produce some new states, but I don't want to reveal exactly which states I am consuming. And there's a mechanism that I'll explain in a second called a nullifier that's used to accomplish this. And then finally, there's this encrypted payload blob that you can think of as being a kind of baked in native like data availability system, right? Where if I make a shielded transaction and I update my um, own, my my account state to reflect that I've changed my balance, I need to be really, really sure that whatever the the plain text version of my new account state is, I will have access to that. Like what happens if I, like my laptop crashes between when I sent the transaction and when it saved my new state, did I just like lose all of my funds? Because, you know, even if they're still committed on chain, if I don't know what they are and I can't um, uh, access them, that's, that's equivalent to loss. So you have some kind of like, I'll encrypt the data to the recipient or to myself, and you kind of bundle all this together. So if you look at this in, in this way, um, like most uh, privacy chains like would not describe themselves in this kind of roll up -y way, but I think it's an interesting um, perspective that, that draws some parallels with uh, the rest of the, the blockchain space. So, um, going on like a little bit of a side quest to explain the, the nullifier idea, right? Um, if I want to prove that um, some state that I'm referencing was previously included in the chain, I can do that um, by witnessing that this uh, state has this commitment and that commitment was included in this Merkle tree. And that proves that uh, it was already, it, that it was validly included at some point. But what I also need to do is establish that I haven't uh, reused the same state twice. So if you're just tracking balances, right, this is how do you prevent a double spend. Um, but if you're doing more general programmability, um, we want to prevent some state from being, uh, forked, right? You should only be able to advance things once. And the problem is that if I were to just say like, here's the specific state that I'm consuming, that would reveal exactly like what I'm doing on chain. Someone would be able to see this whole like chain of, of successive state updates. So I need a way to um, 
uh, create some kind of identifier for each state fragment that is uh, not publicly derivable. And that's exactly what a, a nullifier does. It's called a nullifier because it's used to kind of nullify or remove a state commitment from the active set. Um, and so the, the picture is that you have, uh, you know, your, your state fragment, whatever it is, let's use like the simple example of, of just tracking balances. So a note is like a, a UTXO, you have some value, you have an address that gets to control it. Um, that gets committed and then the commitment goes on chain and is put into this state commitment tree. And the trick is that you use some um, uh, capability attached to this um, state fragment, like the part of the viewing key for the, the address that gets to control it to uh, der like secretly derive like a, a key derivation of a of a different commitment to this fragment in this position in the tree. And by revealing the nullifier, you um, uh, you prevent referencing the same state fragment twice. However, because the derivation of the nullifier is keyed, to some kind of viewing key that only that um, uh, user has access to, a third party can't link uh, the state commitment to the nullifier. So all they see are like these opaque random numbers getting posted to the chain. The chain checks that those nullifiers are not reused and that's enough to um, prevent double spends. Okay. So that that was like a bit of a side quest, but like you know, worth worth talking about. Um, I gave kind of a description of this sort of overall picture of like what is the state model that we're working with. Um, and now I want to tell you about three kind of significant challenges that show up that we had to do protocol design to try to solve. So the first of those uh, challenges is managing client side state. So like I said, we're in this picture of uh, edge compute for the chain and we wanna have everything be managed on the end user device itself. And primarily we've been targeting um, the browser wallet use case just because um, that is the hardest and most annoying uh, environment to try to program for. There's a whole team at Google that is dedicated to like making your life worse as an extension developer. Um, and if you can do that there, you know, you can probably make it work anywhere. So, uh, I mentioned that we have to manage all the state and, and do all the proving on the client. What exactly does a client need to do? So I have this schematic picture of this uh, state of a, a state commitment tree. And remember that our basic paradigm is that the client is gonna prove like, here are my existing states. Here's a, a proof that they were validly included in the, the current tree of everybody's state commitments. And then here's some new states that I am creating as outputs of my transaction. And so there's two kind of tasks that a client has to do to be able to perform that operation. The first is detection. So there's this uh, global tree of every piece of state that has ever been um, uh, created by anyone. And each user needs to figure out like which of the leaves of this tree are relevant to me. And this gets a little bit more complicated than you might think uh, at first when you consider that, for instance, if I send you funds, I'm gonna create a new state fragment that you control and then you have to learn about it somehow. Or you might also need to uh, use your the same wallet on multiple devices. 
And how do all of those devices have a consistent view of, of what's on the chain? So you have to build a system that allows clients to scan through all of the transactions are, that are on the chain and detect which of these fragments are relevant to that user. But it's not enough just to detect. You also have to do tree synchronization because over time, people are going to add more fragments. And as they do that, the uh, global root of here's the Merkle tree of everybody's states uh, will be updated with new states produced by other people. And if you want to prove inclusion, you want to be proving inclusion uh, relative to the most recent Merkle root, because that's going to give you the most anonymity. And so you have to be able to somehow ingest other people's state commitments into your local copy of the, the tree. But we don't want every client to have to process every transaction because that would be terrible, right? We have to somehow do all of this and give you the, the benefit of my anonymity set grows with all the other users without my work also growing. And the penumbra answer to this is to build uh, fast scanning with optionally delegated detection. So as part of the operation of the chain, uh, every time there's a block, the full node will also produce a second data structure that we call a compact block that has minimal data required for syncing. And this is stripped down as much as possible to, re to make the, the bandwidth as, as small as possible. So uh, when you do a spend, that turns into 32 bytes in the compact block. If you do an output, it's about 200. But um, either way, you can batch up a lot of uh, activity of um, other users in this uh, compressed format. And then it's just enough for the client to learn like, oh, something is relevant to me. And then every wallet is going to embed a what we call an ultralight node that syncs, uh, scans, filters, and then locally indexes the state that is visible to that specific wallet. So this is kind of different from what people normally talk about with like light clients, where the goal is about um, how do I have uh, stronger or maybe the same equivalent security guarantees, but without any of the data. Here, the focus is how do I maintain a synchronized version of a filtered version of the chain state that's filtered to like just my state so that instead of having to go, you know, there's on a private chain, there's no RPC that you can call to say, what's my account balance. You have to be able to do that locally. And we needed a way to efficiently synchronize just that one user's state. Uh, finally, if doing the scanning of the compact blocks is too expensive for that client, um, in the protocol, there's also the capability for clients to delegate uh, fuzzy detection of transactions to some third-party server. And that server will hand back all of the transactions that are relevant to them. So no uh, false negatives, uh, but it will have a bunch of false positives that prevents that server from learning exactly what transactions the user made. Um, and the reason that we, we want to have this um, uh, scanning ability is that it allows us to do fast forwarding of the state commitment tree updates. So I mentioned before that one of the things is that as other people add um, data into this Merkle tree, you have to ingest that into your local copy. It kind of sucks if you have to do something just because someone else made a transaction. And to solve this, uh, we made the Merkle tree be slightly less efficient 
in terms of the um you know the height versus size of the tree in order for it to have a structure that makes it easier to synchronize so we have these intermediate roots for each block and epoch which is a, a group of blocks um we have a it's a snark friend like a poseidon based uh quad tree and there's three levels of uh intermediate merkle trees so we get um uh, I think depth uh, of 24 of quad trees, so two to the 48 in total, but it's split up into three tiers of eight levels each. And what this means is that as a client is synchronizing their local instance of this tree, it can skip over entire blocks or epochs. So in the implementation of this, it's a lazy data structure, it's written in Rust. And um, whenever you insert a leaf node, you have to specify in the API, is this a, a node that I want to retain or one that I want to forget? And the tree will efficiently uh, track uh, exactly which um, uh, subset of the data is needed to store all of the off paths to the nodes that you're trying to retain. And you can insert these kind of summarized updates that allow you to uh, skip over other people's stuff that you don't care about. And what that means is that the cost of the client's work to synchronize their local state commitment tree is only proportional to their activity, like which nodes are they trying to retain and uh, track uh, Merkle paths for. And the fact that somebody else is spamming a million transactions or, you know, spamming is not a group. Anyway, the fact that somebody else did a million transactions doesn't matter because they can see that those transactions are not relevant to them and then just fast forward over all of those commitments. So this is kind of the, the big uh, like client side work that, that we did is build the capability to do delegated detection and have a fast forwardable uh, Merkle tree. And we think that that together um, uh, is enough to have scalable private clients. One, one thing that I'll note though, just as a kind of markup on the slides is Although we have the uh, fuzzy message detection built into the protocol, we didn't actually implement any of the any of the detection infrastructure because um, so far it hasn't been necessary. Um, the native Rust code uh, is able to scan about like I think ten thousand blocks per second, um, and so we haven't we haven't felt the need to build the the kind of outsourcing part yet but it's kind of kept in the, in the back pocket for future scaling. Um, but, but an important takeaway here is like up to this point, right? I, and actually in the rest of the talk, I didn't talk really much at all about like, oh, doing the client side proving. And the reason for that is what we realized is that if you're building a fully private system, your biggest challenge actually is not the proving, it's the state management and the synchronization. And so pretty much all of the novelty points that we put into like, you know, making a snark friendly primitive that actually went into making a snark friendly Merkle tree that was efficiently synchronizable. And that was the highest goal rather than making something that is like as fast as possible to prove. So that's the first challenge. The second challenge is shared state. Um, so if we uh, think of the, the diagram that I showed you about how, okay, execution is gonna move off chain. Every transaction is its own little micro rollup. That's a very cool story. However, there's this problem, which is how do we recover late binding? So what we have in that diagram is early binding. Here's a transaction, here are the states that it consumes, here are the states that it produces. And this is like, this fully like sealed blob of state changes. But 
what people generally want when they interact with programmable chains is like not that what they want is the capability to have late binding right so i want to be able to specify here's this transaction and these are these states that are you know say like my account balance or something i know exactly what those are and then there's this other variable that when the transaction is actually executed the shared state is going to be like slotted into this blob and then that'll determine what the outputs are right so when somebody makes a swap on uniswap they don't sign over and here's the exact state of the uniswap reserves right that's the whole where the sequencing happens and you know also that's where the, the the mev happens and you can't really do this with a, a a zk um if you're making each transaction be its own proved uh state transition so how do we get something that is like what people want um and the way that we ended up thinking about this was thinking that we need a better concurrency model for doing uh, management of shared state. I mentioned right at the very beginning of the talk that one of the appealing things about trying to build a private DEX is that it's a useful technical proof of concept for how do you make all of the uh, pieces of the architecture fit with each other. Um, and you run like right into this problem and uh, the fact that you're trying to do it, you know, in the DEX context, it's like, okay, maybe we can come up with a simplified thing and then generalize from there. So what we got to was, what if we tried to model concurrency with message passing rather than locking, right? Like in the EVM, for instance, every single transaction that gets executed is uh, going to take a, a global lock on the entire state of the world. And there's various scaling ideas of like, okay, how could we like lock less? But what if we just tried to model uh, concurrency using message passing? Because if you're making your own L1, you get to have complete control over your state model. And this kind of leads to the, the idea of what if you tried to have more like an actor model for blockchains. So we can have transactions that are going to pass messages to contracts, each contract can execute once per block on all the messages that have received, allowing uh, batch processing. And the user state uh, can be async, uh, can, uh, there's a word that's missing, whatever. Anyway, the user state can, can change uh, async off-chain in ZK. And this actually unlocks both scalability and privacy kind of in one go because you're segmenting like where the state changes are happening to particular domains. And then uh, within that domain, you're making state changes at the, the minimum time interval that is provided by consensus, right? Any kind of ordering is uh, something that's happening at you know, a finer time resolution that's actually provided by the, the consensus mechanism. And this is kind of an, an interesting alternate approach. It also mentioned that like the whole idea of like app specific sequencing or whatever is not as powerful as being able to do batch processing. Uh, if the contract is given, here is a batch of all the messages that have uh, been sent in this block. It could do uh, some kind of app specific sequencing of those messages. But it could also say like sum them up and then do um, uh, one batch and amortize the cost of the execution over all the messages. So this is strictly more powerful than a sequencing based model because the, the way that you process this batch is could be that you impose your, your own contract specific order or you could do something um, more powerful. Okay, so that's a side note, but the the way that you can do this with um, uh, with zk is as follows. So we're going to make a transaction that has some private inputs, 
And if we think about the um, the, the diagram that I had before, we're, we're trying to figure out some way that we can slot in some external state into this. And what we're going to do is we're going to think about the um, we're going to think about this uh, sort of shape of the transaction that we want to perform as being a an async program. So we're going to think of it as uh, the the place where we would have had late binding of some chain state is actually going to be a place where we receive a message from the chain as if we're like, okay, await on what is the, the state. And when you have uh, some kind of async program, there's a transformation that you can do. Um, this is the way that Rust async is implemented, for instance, where every await point, um, the, the, the future that you get is transformed into a state machine where every await point is like the state while you're waiting for that message to come in. And so we're gonna take the, the kind of async uh, program that we would have wanted to write um, and transform it into a state machine. And for each intermediate state, we're going to uh, mint some kind of state commitment that commits to the entire intermediate execution state. And that's going to be recorded into the state commitment tree. And the shielded transaction uh, is going to be able to send a message to whatever contract it's trying to uh, interact with asynchronously. And once that interaction happens, the way that we model a message coming back is uh, that, that message from that contract um, can be provided as an input to a subsequent transaction that will consume that commitment to the intermediate state and uh, then make a proof that like, okay, now that I've got the, the data that is filling in this, this round circle, um, I can now produce privately what the outputs are supposed to be. So this may or may not have made sense in this like kind of fully general um, schematic but let me give um, an example of, of how we use this for doing batch swaps uh, on Penumbra. So the, the chief problem that we're trying to solve there is like, if I'm doing a shielded transaction, I have to be minting my outputs. Um, but when I, uh, uh, when I submit the transaction, I don't know exactly what the, the market price is gonna be. So here's how this works with kind of the private state side and the public state side. So for the private state, um, a user has some you know, balances and they're gonna produce a transaction that includes the batch input that they're trying to swap. Like if I'm trying to do say a hundred um to USDC, uh, I'll make a swap action that has this 100 um input They'll also privately mint a commitment to the swap that they've initiated. Once this transaction reaches the chain, it'll get batched together with all of the other swaps uh, for that pair, um, summed up into a batch total. And then that gets handed off to the DEX engine to resolve this trade intent. Um, and we'll treat that as a black box for the moment. Um, but the output of that, this is like happening at the end of every block that includes a swap, is there's a piece of output data that says, okay, here's the total amount of batch inputs, the total amount of batch outputs, and that's kind of the price information for that batch swap. And so in any subsequent transaction or any subsequent block, the user who had created this uh, swap transaction can create a swap claim where they privately consume their swap commitment and then um, uh, take the output data with the prices as a, a public input to their proof and privately mint the pro rata share of their output. 
And due to the way that we um, designed and implemented this, although this requires a second transaction, that transaction is actually self-authenticating. And so a user never needs to sign anything. Um, and from their perspective, it can be done entirely automatically by their um, user agent. What this enables though, when I was, so I was talking about um, being able to do uh, more efficient processing because of the batching. If you imagine that you're only going to run your decks like once per block, you can potentially do much cooler and more efficient, uh, economically efficient processing because you know that you're um, getting to amortize that execution cost over everybody's inputs. And that's where we get to the public state side of this. Uh, and this is kind of the, the power of the batching. So I mentioned that we're kind of like group all the inputs by pair, but because we're doing this at the end of the block um, as part of the native chain logic, once the DEX engine has summed up all of the batch totals, it has a view of here's all the trade intent for the block all at once. And it can then put that into this big global liquidity graph and do some kind of global resolution of the trading intent with optimal arbitrage. So the Penumbra DEX engine actually does uh, on-chain routing and um, uh, ARBs, uh, any mispriced positions um, into consistency. There's a lot of very cool stuff that I'm not going to get into in the in the rest of the talk, but that's kind of one approach for trying to have async interactions between um, uh, private state and public state. And those are cases where um, we need to do some kind of private state update. Like I'm, I'm trying to mint my um, pro rata uh, shares. It's also useful though, as it turns out to have um, private handles for public state. So the model for Penumbra is that the actual DEX state itself is public, but you only see aggregate information, right? Like you don't get to see who owns what position or um, what somebody's trading history was. Uh, you just get to see like, this is the current market depth. Um, and the, the other design idea that we developed here is um, uh, making stateful NFTs for the positions. So the state machine of a position is like you open it and then it's active, you can close the position. Um, and then there's a withdraw reserves step that comes after closure so that um, you know, at the point that you close it, you might not know exactly what the final reserves of the position will be once that transaction is actually sequenced and executed. Um, and okay, the idea of putting uh, tracking position ownership with an NFT is not new, but what is new is um, rather than just tracking that state as a piece of uh, on-chain state, it's actually tracked in the uh, token ID. So the open position for LP with ID, whatever, is a separate token type from the closed position state. And what that means is that we can use the value balance mechanism to track that state transitions are happening correctly. So when I open a position, I'm gonna have that, act, that action will create one of these open position NFTs. Um, and when I close it, it'll consume an open position NFT, produce a closed NFT. Um, and this has some really interesting emergent behavior. Like you can create a transaction that has both of these open and close actions in one transaction. And that means that it'll automatic, uh, uh, sorry, atomically open and close the transaction in the same block. But because those actions are actually executed uh, in batches at the end of the block, that allows someone to create, here's some liquidity, that is gonna be valid for only the, the next block that this transaction is included in. 
And we actually think we can generalize this model to private interchain accounts where you can um, interact with some other state on some other app chain um, using some bearer NFT uh, inside the Penumbra Shield pool. All right, so um, I you know, want to be mindful of the time, so I'll just kind of quickly go over this, this third part, which is about uh, how do you actually build front ends for any of this? Um, and the insight is that unlike the kind of transparent architecture where all of the data is public and you have this pretty uh, clean data flow, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of conflating full nodes and indexers, but you have a pretty clean data flow where it's like, okay, the network allows someone to synchronize the state of the chain, then they can either have a front end query that or just render the front end on the server directly and ship it off to the user. And then a user can request to sign something and then broadcast the transaction, right? This is the kind of conventional model. Um, the transaction ends up in the, the MEV machine at the end. Um, this has some cool features. Like you can have many different front ends for the same chain. And uh, the reason that works is they can all read from the same, like one big database of public information. And when you're building a private chain, that doesn't work. So we have this challenge of how do we do a connect wallet type of user experience in a private context? And to uh, address that, what, what we built is we kind of split up the uh, client part to have the concepts of a view service that provides access to that user's data and a custody service that is providing the authorization. So the conceptual flow is uh, that the view service kind of interposes between the front end and the full node and synchronizes all of the private states where you put all of that complicated logic I was describing about doing fast syncing that goes in this like one place. And the front end can then just query that private state as if it was, you know, local RPC or something. Um, the other complication that shows up that we had to deal with was a uh, transaction comprehension for a shielded transaction, right? If your transaction is uh, fully opaque, then you can't really meaningfully sign it because you wouldn't know what it's doing. So we had to build a system for transaction authorization where you actually do the signing before the transaction is constructed. So you have a concept of a transaction plan and you sign the plan and then that's used to build the, the final shielded transaction. Um, and that lets uh, a user like auth uh, while looking at the data. Um, and the way that those sort of uh, pieces kind of map onto the uh, sort of where this code is executing uh, as the last part is uh, we have the network and the full node. These are kind of other people's computers. And then we have another box, which is web content, right? This is gonna execute on your computer, but you don't necessarily trust it, right? Like the front end could be malicious and we wanna be mindful of that. So you get the front end from someone else's computer and then you have this browser extension and that can be a uh, trusted code because it's on like coming from an unknown source, it's on your computer. The view service that runs this ultralight syncing node is inside of the extension and synchronizes all of the private state. And now this front end that you got from somewhere, some third party front end can receive selective disclosure of decrypted private state. So now that front end can have access to like your uh, specific account data, um, and it can do stuff. It turns out that, you know, you want to have a way to translate, like a, a front-end app dev doesn't want to have to figure out like which notes do I spend, right? So there's a way for them to submit a kind of high-level transaction intent 
for do stuff and then go off, witness, build, prove, whatever, everything that needs to happen to make the transaction happen. Um, and the view service then proxies that through to uh, a custody service. Right now we only support software custody, but we could have ledger support uh, with no kind of architectural changes. And then that's what the user sees. They get to have this pop up with a, a view of the plan. Um, and then, you know, going back the other way, you, you end up broadcasting the transaction. So three things to note about this that are kind of interesting. One is the fact that no keys ever leave the extension means that using many front ends is relatively safe, right? Like implicit in the idea of a connect wallet button is that you should be able to disconnect. And if you're handing out keys, that's irrevocable. So we had to build a real-time selective disclosure system, which also is gonna be pretty useful for you know, doing accounting or um, trying to like demonstrate compliance. All that infrastructure exists. The second piece that's kind of nice about this design is that the syncing happens once per browser and not once per front end. So the Penumbra Labs team can be in charge of like doing all of the insane Merkle tree optimizations in one place in this uh, Chrome extension. And those performance improvements apply to every single third-party front end that just gets to treat it as if it was an RPC. And the final like neat tidbit is the way that we designed the transaction signing. Uh, the signatures don't sign over the proofs. They only sign over the output commitments that say what the output states will be. And this means that we can do proving in parallel with the user reviewing the pop-up. Uh, and so as long as we get the client side proving down to say several seconds long, from the user's point of view, it has uh, like zero proving speed or uh, latency. Um, we're not there yet with the WASM prover, but the uh, time to do a end-to-end uh, -end proving on a, um, like a basic transfer transaction, if you're running in native code, is about uh, 700 milliseconds. Um, and so we're kind of right at the threshold of like, if a user had to authorize it, it would be effectively free. So um, that's that's all that I had to share. Um, so I ran uh, a few minutes over the, the target, but here we are. Um, there's some links to try it out and I'm happy to answer any questions. Wow, that's what that was a like phenomenal presentation. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I have countless questions, uh, but like mm, uh, I start with one. I allow others to ask their questions as well. My first question is: I didn't really follow how the Dex ma maintains the like uh, global state that like gives us the uh, price in the sense that. If the user's transactions are private, we probably don't want to leak how much of like asset A they are willing to swap with asset B. If that's the case, how do we get the sum of like uh, asset transfers for the batch? Yeah, so we don't try to make that um, private. In a, in, a, in the first version of Penumbra, uh, the design, we had a whole plan of doing um, additively homomorphic threshold decryption. Got it. Um, and then we gave up on that because uh, we already had like three projects worth of scope and um, our thinking is basically that um, if you're only revealing the amount of the trade, uh, this isn't really that different from saying like, here's a ticker of what the trades are. And that feels like useful kind of market information. Like mm -hmm. being able to see like, what's the volume on the decks is actually something that users care about. 
rather than something that they would want to hide. I mean, there's other projects that try to do like a full dark pool. Um, but our thought process is that from a, a product perspective, we want to um, uh, allowing people to have each interaction be unlinked from everything that came before is a sufficiently valuable thing. But the 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 swap mechanism is designed to be able to to drop in uh, threshold decryption of the batch totals um, at some point if if you know if there was uh, effort. But in, until you get sufficient volume, it's sort of like, well, if, if you're gonna decrypt the batch and you're the only person in the batch. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, I was also a bit confused about this. Thanks for a great talk, by the way. Uh, at first, I didn't understand what's public, what's private. I think your explanation and the DEX example made a lot of sense. It sounds like kind of the reserves and the current mm -hmm. market state is public, but the user's own state is private. Yeah, uh, exactly. How do, do you think this generalizes to other applications or it just works well with the anons and, and it needs to be decided on a case-by-case -case basis? Um, I, what I would say is there's kind of two ways to, to, um, to answer the question. The first is like, yeah, or there's two ways that you could generalize. So one way is you could try to do something similar to what we did for the DEX engine, where it's kind of this like native or enshrined functionality. Um, and For being able to do like spot trading of, of tokens, there's a lot of reasons why it's very, very useful to have that kind of natively integrated. Whether that's that you like get price oracles or the fact that like if you can't trade between assets within a shielded pool, you don't really have a multi-asset shielded pool. You just have like a bunch of single asset shielded pools kind of bolted together. Um, if you have a, a shielded pool where you can exchange assets, that's like much more useful than not. And so that kind of makes sense to have natively enshrined functionality. There's probably other applications like maybe lending or perps um, where doing a kind of top-down design process of like, how would you integrate a like privacy into this makes sense. However, that work is not really scalable. And so the other approach that I mentioned about having these sort of stateful NFTs um, and that that could generalize to a kind of interchain account model, um, I think is probably an, a more promising next step because there's a clearer pathway to uh, like, there's all these different apps on different chains. There's all these people who are putting effort into building those and if you could provide a way to interact with those um, where you know your interaction is public, but it's in this sort of private scope, um, that feels a lot more uh, like a like a more efficient kind of capability increment than let's figure out like the next step on like the penumbra team out implements the entire rest of the DeFi ecosystem which you know is a is a challenge we've been we've not been doing like that bad of a job of it but like not it, you know we gotta we gotta pace ourselves I have one more question, like maybe two, about sure. like uh, the message passing, uh, and like uh, how does um, so? First of all, my understanding is because we have this batch uh, execution, and like each contract can be executed once per uh, block, we effectively lose the ability to atomically compose contracts. Is that yes. correct or not? Yes, because... and also Penumbra itself doesn't. The, the contract there is like kind of conceptual. 
Penumbra itself doesn't have a on-chain programmability. Uh, mm -hmm. We only have this enshrined, you know, functionality. But we think of the DEX as being basically a like natively provided uh, enshrined contract. Um, but otherwise, we would be in this kind of cross-chain like IBC world where we send a message out to a connected counterparty chain, and then it does stuff. And at that point, you're already in the kind of async composability world. So the coming from a non-EVM context, the loss of atomic composability is not as large because we are kind of already orienting towards this like app chain mindset. Makes perfect sense. So my understanding is the goal currently is not to necessarily generalize this model to like a generic smart contract chain with uh, yeah. this specific statement. Got it. Yeah, I think that the, the way that would be best to generalize uh, from a, a user perspective is, is like the cross-chain account mechanism that I mentioned where um, we could provide a way for uh, a user to, to fund from inside the shielded pool a ephemeral account on another chain and then they go off, do their, you know, uh, atomically composable transaction actions uh, in public. And then once they're done with that set of stuff, they mm -hmm. can sort of come back to their home base of the shielded set. Got it, got it. I mean, it, 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 I mean, from the from your presentation, uh, uh, it looks like you've you've done a massive job in terms of like defining new many new primitives and like uh, new ways of looking at the stuff at least i'm not uh, i was not familiar mm -hmm. with many of the things you mentioned so great job <laughs> and thanks, thanks for sharing yeah uh, yeah and thanks everyone for staying a bit longer um, i think uh, i guess we can wrap up here and thanks henry right. again and uh, thanks everyone bye-bye all right bye